Ah! You guys didn't want to listen to me before, but I know you're going to listen now. Ladies and gentlemen, coming to you from the Spit Studios in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, this is the Spit Sports Show, here to talk to you about your Detroit Lions and what they did and what they are going to do mostly against the San Francisco 49ers next week. Okay, before I start... I want to touch on the Bucks game a little bit. Although this is not the main storyline that I want to be talking about, because obviously the next game is a lot more important as it's the freaking NFC Championship. First NFC Championship game for the Lions since 1991. I don't even want to explain all of the things that either hadn't been invented or hadn't been released and just like the Blackberry was eight years away from... I don't even want to get into all of that. I want to touch on the Bucks game really quickly, but my main focus is going to be why the Lions not only have a chance against the 49ers why I think they are going to win against the 49ers straight up money line no points involved I'm going to get to that in a second but first let me touch on this Bucks game for a little bit Baker played as well as you could have played um, good for him but at the end of the day our team was just better than theirs we were expected to win and we did win O-line I thought was the MVP of the game um, that one yard run on fourth down was just straight up penetration by the middle of the line shout out Frank Rag now our center hell of a game by him um, three of the top five greatest off graded offensive linemen from this weekend from pro football focus were on our offensive line. That was Panay Sewell, Frank Ragnow, and Jonah Jackson. All of them played fantastic. All of our rookies were phenomenal. Jameer Gibbs. Oh my gosh, this guy's the new Alvin Kamara and I'm so glad he's on our team. Absolute game breaker running back Laporta, even though he's not 100%. If we need someone over the middle that isn't named St. Brown, it's going to be him every single time, and he's only going to get healthier. Brian Branch led the team in tackles. He's been phenomenal in the slot all season. As he gets better, we might have to transition him to the outside, but he's such a great chess piece. Melifongwu, speaking of chess pieces, where the hell did this guy come from? Drafted him in 2021, didn't really make much of a start at all until about week 13, but since then, he's been a flat-out revelation. He's very highly graded, and that stop on Mike Evans on that two-point conversion was big time. He has been all over the field for the past few weeks. Absolute revelation on defense. And shout-out to Aaron Glenn as well. His Eureka defensive corner blitzes and safety blitzes, stuff that really has to keep your offensive line honest, and you, and the as the quarterback... You got to look all over the field now. You're not just looking at linebackers blitz and you can get a slot corner coming off the edge. That's a big game changer. He's found that since week 16. Good for Aaron Glenn. These corner blitzes have been fantastic. But at the end of the day, when all the cards were on the table, our offense, which had mostly been held to a low roar thanks to the Bucks stopping our run game really well, with six minutes left in the game, Jared Goff put on a flat-out masterclass. That third and 15 to Amon Ra was as big as it gets. That was as perfect a ball as you could possibly throw. Hit him right in the numbers, right in this number 14, actually. And that touchdown, which might have been the best pass I've seen him throw all year, just dropped it in the bucket on a slot wheel route. That is not an easy throw to make, and he made it perfectly. Both of those going to top three receiver in the NFL, Alvin Ross St. Brown. I'm going to get to him in a second, but most of Baker's yards, um, like I said, he did play well, but most of them came on that one drive before the half because for some reason we decided to play Cam Sutton, our number one corner on Mike Evans without any safety help, um, which is just flat out dumb. Aaron, easily Aaron Glenn's worst decision of the day because um, Sutton isn't very good man to man. He's a good zone corner. He's smart. He's a, he's a destitute man's Richard Sherman. But one-on-one -on -one against Mike Evans, Buddy just has no chance. And we saw that at the end of the half. And we saw that on the last touchdown they had where Evans just went up and snagged it on him. Only 89 rush yards for the Bucs. Uh, Detroit's run defense was great. We were the better team we were supposed to win. Anyways, enough of the past. We were supposed to beat the Bucs. We weren't supposed to beat the Rams, according to most people. I know we're the Vegas favorites, but we were supposed to beat the Bucs. So I spent so much time on the Rams, and I spent so little time on the Bucs. But you know who we're definitely not supposed to beat? According to literally everybody except me, apparently, the 49ers next week. And listen, I understand why. They've been to a bunch of NFC Championship games. I think they've been to almost all of the last four. I think they might have missed one in there. I should have looked that up. But anyways, they've been to a lot of NFC Championship games. They have a lot of playoff experience. They've won a lot of playoff games. Their coach is looked at as this boy genius. I don't need so much of a boy anymore. He's like mid-40s. But he's an absolute genius offensively. They have a very, very talented roster. One of the best defenses. One of the best offenses. All of that. 
totally get it. If you just look on paper, you might not like our chances. However, as I look through the All-22 and I start grinding the film and looking at these matchups and seeing truly what is going to be on display on that gridiron next Sunday, this Sunday, I like our chances more and more. So let me just try to go down this matchup for you and explain why the Lions have way more than just a puncher's chance in this game. So by, obviously, the most important position in any football game is the quarterback. Anyone could agree with that. That's number one. Who has the better quarterback? We do. It's really not close. If you watch Brock Purdy, listen, I totally understand that he led the league in passer rating and yards per attempt and all of these cute stats that everyone seems to really care about. But if you watch the games, the beauty of the NFL is all of these games are on television. And looking through the stat sheet is just a way to enhance that. You know what I mean? You see something on TV, you can go look at a stat sheet and see if it you know reflects what you've been seeing. If you watch Brock Purdy and Jared Goff play and you confidently say that Brock Purdy is the better quarterback, I don't know what to tell you because you can't analyze football. Goff is bigger. He's got a better arm. He's been here before. He's a proven playoff performer at this point. Guy can ball when it matters most. And if you watched Brock Purdy against the Packers, I'm going to get into a little bit more later, but he looked like trash for the majority of that game. I get that he had a drive, but he was very bad. Quarterback advantage goes to us. He's also one of our leaders. Everybody, everybody believes in him. You, you can just see it from that locker room and the way Frank Rag, now again, our center, talked about him after the game. He's just better than Purdy is right now. So quarterback goes to us. All right, let's keep going. Weapons. I'm going to stay on the offensive side of the ball for now. Give me a second. I'll get to the defense. I promise. But the weapons to me are close. But if Debo doesn't play, it obviously goes to the Lions. Look, tight end, they've got Kittle. We've got Laporta. Kittle's probably a little bit better blocker. But in terms of pass catching, if Laporta's about... If Laporta's close to 100%, which another week, given that knee some rest, I think he will be. It's hard not to say Laporta isn't just as good a pass catcher as Kittle is. When it comes to IU, he's their number one receiver Amon Ra is just straight up better than he is. Now, Samuel is such a crazy chess piece they can do a million things with. But we have guys like that, too. Hopefully, Khalif Raymond comes back. Uh, Josh Reynolds is going to be a big factor for us. He's been awesome in these playoffs so far. Obviously, those don't compare to Debo. But in combination and what Ben Johnson's able to do with all of those guys, I definitely say it's at least a coin flip if Debo plays. But if he doesn't, the weapons advantage definitely goes to the Lions, and that's not even mentioning running back, where I understand they probably have the best running back in the world, but we have the new Alvin Kamara, and David Montgomery is as good as a of a third down, close yardage back, goal line back as there is right now, and running behind that O-line, I don't bet against them. Speaking of offensive line, the Lions have the single best offensive line in the world. It has been all year. It was only ranked behind the Eagles for most of the year, and I think we all know how the Eagles O-line turned out against the Bucks, who we just played against and just played a phenomenal pass protection and run protection game against for the most part. But our offensive line is the best in the world, led by the single best offensive lineman in the world, Panay Sewell. Trent Williams was him for a long time, but he's gotten a little older, and it's Panay's time. Now, San Francisco's O-line is no slouch. And it's going to be tough for us to get pressure consistently. But if you're going O-line advantage, I'd give it to the Lions. All right, so just roster for roster, stacked up, offense versus offense, you have to give it to Detroit. Listen, I understand that the San Francisco's top of the top pieces, their McCaffrey's and their Debo's, they're probably a little bit better than our top of the top, except for Amon Ra and probably Jameer Gibbs. But in combination, especially with us signing Zach Ertz as a little just chess piece to put in that with Josh Reynolds, Khalif Raymond, Jamison Williams, who I even forgot to mention, can take the top off of defense. And our O-line, you got to give that to Detroit. But the real difference in this game and the reason everyone is picking the 49ers is because they have a way better defense than we do statistically they were second in the or third in the league in points allowed we were something like 23rd but here's what i'm gonna say about that detroit's defense uh, since that uh, abject disaster against the bears in week 14 where we let them score 28 we let justin fields have a coming out party everyone in the bears organization for one week thought he was going to be the answer over caleb williams because he played our defense it was a disaster 
one of the worst games, if not, in fact, it was the worst game we played all season. Since then, here are the points that they have given up in each game. So against the Broncos, when the Broncos were still well in the playoff hunt, they needed this game. They let the Broncos score 17. They allowed 24 to the Vikings the next week. Then they only allowed 21 to Dallas in Dallas, where they averaged 31 points a game. They let Dak score 21 against the secondary. 20 to the Vikings the next week. Then in the playoffs, it starts. Only allowed 23 to the Rams, who had the single hottest offense in the NFL going into that game. Since week eight, they'd scored the most points. Their quarterback was as hot as could get, and they had one of the, they, they had Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua going up against our secondary. We only let them score 23. And then last week, 23 points allowed against Tampa Bay. Now listen, if football games were decided by yards gained instead of score, I would be petrified of this matchup against the 49ers. But good thing for us, the goal is to not allow points. And what the Lions defense does really well is take some big swings. Their whole goal isn't necessarily to stop you. Because I think Aaron Glenn knows darn well they don't have the talent to consistently stop people based on, you know, just a base cover two and, you know, man to man cover one and just like basic coverages and stuff like that. They go for sacks. They go for big sacks. They're trying to create turnovers. This is a big play defense. This isn't necessarily a defense that's going to hold you to constant third downs and get stops on third and seven and all that kind of stuff. We're probably going to give up a third and 15 in this game, maybe even longer. But here's the thing. If we can get Brock Purdy shaken, if we can make him uncomfortable, which is what we've done to Baker Mayfield, to Matthew Stafford for a certain extent, when we threw him out of the game, pretty much, you can't tell me he was comfortable sitting in that pocket. I think Purdy can he will shrink flatly I think Purdy will shrink I saw him against Green Bay last week and don't give me that stuff about the rain all of that stuff that's it's an excuse for sure it's something to look at but in general he made some throws that genuinely I have like not NF they weren't NFL throws they were throws you'd see from a high school quarterback who like played running back for most of his career and was just trying it out like balls thrown into the dirt on deep routes. You had some just flying 15 yards over receivers. He wanted to throw two pick sixes. Somehow both of them were dropped. Like, excuse me. Lions capitalize on those opportunities more often than they don't. So if we can get Purdy shaken, I absolutely think we can have success against him in the passing game. But Everybody knows that their engine is their running game led by Christian McCaffrey, who I think is just phenomenal. You will never hear me say a bad word about that, man. I think he's the best in the world at what he does. But what has the Detroit defense done best this year? Easily stop the run. They were second in the league this year at stopping the run. The Detroit Lions were. Ali McNeil back in the middle is huge for this defense. Hutchinson is a better run defender than most people think he is. Our linebacker, Jack Campbell, our other rookie who doesn't get mentioned as much, even though he's not much of a big play linebacker, a sideline to sideline guy, he's very good at clogging up holes in the middle. Alex Anzalone, that's what he does best. Our other linebacker, he stops the run. Our corners are good tacklers. Overall, we stopped the run really well. So if we can stop that engine from going, that that train that leads them all, that Christian McCaffrey train, all the pressure goes on Purdy, who, like I said, I think we can make uncomfortable. And looking at the 49ers defense, which is supposed to be this formidable, unbeatable, unstoppable unit, they are led by Fred Warner in the middle, who I've mentioned a ton in this podcast because I think he's absolutely phenomenal quarterback of the defense extraordinaire he is the ultimate sideline to sideline linebacker and he can stop the run one of the best in the world but their pass rush which we all know is super important against Jared Goff if Jared Goff has time he's a top three passer in the world if he doesn't he's more towards the 17 16 15 range it's a big difference it hasn't it's not the same as it used to be their pass rush Bosa's phenomenal They have a great edge rusher, no doubt about it. But Chase Young has not been what they thought he was going to be. He straight up isn't very good at football. He's a good, he's a solid player. 
He's all right, but he's no game breaker. And we can match him up one-on-one -on -one against Decker or Sewell and take him out of the game. Their interior defensive linemen are fine, but no better than what we have in McNeil, who is easily the best interior defensive lineman between both teams. Listen, if Goff can stay protected against this defense, I have no doubt that he's going to be able to complete some passes. And... <laughs> Just don't just don't let it happen. We have the best O-line in the world going up against a pass rush that had no sacks against Jordan Love that has not been hot recently. And listen, everyone wants to talk about the Lions being outside for this game. It's in San Francisco and, you know, it's not in a dome and Goff doesn't do very well on the road. Well, to put it quite simply, those are lies told to you by the media to try to undermine the greatness of Jared Goff and how great he's been this season. The Lions this season are 6-2 and two at home and 6-3 and three on the road. And I will remind you, one of those road losses became because of a simple ref miscommunication screw-up. Not, not miscommunication between us, mind you. Between the officials. We got screwed in that game. We should be 7-2 and two on the road and 6-2 and two at home. But, you know, ifs and buts and all of that stuff. I understand. But we are just as good on the road as we are at home this year. We beat Kansas City in their house week one. We knocked off the Packers last year in Lambeau in Aaron Rodgers' last game in Green Bay to knock him out of the playoffs. Oh my gosh, that one felt so good. But anyways, I'm reminiscing at this point. It's supposed to be a nice day in San Francisco, so the weather isn't supposed to be too much of an issue. This whole on the road, not in a dome thing, I think is going to be way overrated. And San Francisco, it might be a bit windy, but it's not Chicago. I've been to, I've been to San Francisco or in the area. It's it's not a windy city. It's very very nice. Can it rain sometimes? Yeah, but it's not supposed to. And the thing that I haven't touched on yet because I wanted to save it for last is coaching. Kyle Shanahan versus Dan Campbell. Now listen. You can make it about that matchup if you want. I'm not going to. Dan Campbell doesn't call plays on the offense. Doesn't call plays on the defense. All he does is rile up his guys better than any other coach in the NFL and motivate them better than any coach in the NFL. He is going to have these guys ready to play on Sunday. I have no doubt about that. That's what Dan Campbell's going to do. So let's take him out of it. Kyle Shanahan versus Ben Johnson. Both of them are flat out geniuses. Gotta be honest. But Ben Johnson last week even while taking 17 interviews, it felt like, including he literally had two interviews before the game on Sunday, still put up a masterful game plan against the Bucs and scored 30 points. Um, so this week, he's got a clear plate. No more interviews to do. Crossing my fingers. I don't see any booked right now. He is the next Kyle Shanahan, and he happens to be on our sideline. Now, Kyle's great. And I'm sure he's going to find ways to just dissect this defense as best as he can. But Ben Johnson and Kyle Shanahan is no mismatch. And on defense, listen, Steve Wilkes, the 49ers defensive coordinator, is dang good. He's very good. But he's not D'Amico Ryans, who was their defensive coordinator last year, who might be the coach of the year this year for Houston. And the reason I bring that up is people's, I think, perception of the 49ers defense is a lot based on history. And what they have been. This year, are they that same dominant defense that they were in 2020 when Garoppolo went to the Super Bowl? I don't think so. So I think the Lions have much better of a chance in this game than most people think. If you can get a touchdown on this game, I don't know how you don't take the plus seven. Because everything I see when I look down player by player, position group by position group, coaching, all of this. Why can't Detroit win this game? Pedigree? Because we haven't done it before? Nothing happens for the first time until it happens for the first time. I know Detroit in a Super Bowl just doesn't sound right to most of you. But it's a football game. And any given Sunday, this can happen. And people looking at the Lions as these hopeless underdogs, I don't think they're looking at the rosters. Or the player, or the coaches. Or the history. And what they've done this season. Also, all of the pressure is on the 49ers. All of it. The Lions are playing with complete house money right now. They're not supposed to be here. They're not supposed to beat the Niners. Let's see what happens if the game's close after a couple quarters. Let's see if Purdy tightens up. Let's see if he can do it.
because I know that Jared Goff is going to be cool, calm, and collected, and we'll see what happens from there. Anyways, thank you guys so much for listening to the Spit Sports Show. I'm really excited for this next episode coming up. I've been working on it for a while. Why is the NFL so popular? That's going to be the next one. As always, thank you guys so much for listening. I want to know, who do you guys think is going to win in this Detroit-San Fran matchup? What are you taking on the point spread? Who do you think is going to win on the AFC side between Kansas City and Baltimore? I'm probably going to do a video on that soon as well. What a fascinating matchup. What a weekend it is going to be. Thank you all so much, and I will see you in the next one. Go Lions!